Hi, my name is Dave Huxtable and I'm here in Nairobi, Africa to investigate the fabulous diversity of the languages in this vibrant continent. So we'll be looking at some fascinating grammar, an absolutely amazing array of creativity when it comes to speech sounds and some really beautiful writing systems. Stay with us. Changing the vowels in between 19 classes of nouns. That means the bird flew away. That's all right. That's really good. It's good. So it's Black History Month at the moment, which is February in the United States and I think November in the UK. I mean, not that it's not November in the UK at the moment because it's February. In the United States, there's not that big a time difference. So whenever you're watching this, there's a one in six chance that it's Black History Month somewhere in the world. And so I wanted to commemorate that month by investigating and sharing my findings about the marvelous linguistic diversity of the continent of Africa. So here it goes. I have a nasty feeling that um, at least some people will imagine that African languages are somehow primitive. Nothing could be further from the truth. We will see that Africa is home to immensely rich, complex and expressive languages. And just to be clear, there is no such thing as a primitive language. All languages just kind of demonstrate the magnificent power of human creativity. If we look at the map of the language families of Africa, we can see that there are these big, broad, horizontal stripes that go across the continent. And the topmost one of those is the Afro-Asiatic languages, which, as the name suggests, hang out in both Africa and Asia. The Asiatic bit comes from the fact that Arabic, as well as being the language of millions of people in North Africa, is, of course, also spoken in the Arabian Peninsula. It's a member of the Semitic family, along with Hebrew, Aramaic, Maltese, and Amharic. A fun feature that ties together all the Afro-Asiatic languages is the fact that when you conjugate verbs, the beginnings change as well as the ends. For example, Amharic is a Semitic language and is the main language of Ethiopia. If we look at the compound imperfect of the verb subbura, which means to break, it goes as follows. Isabrallahu, tisabralla, tisabriallash, yisabral, tisabrallach, inisabrallan, tisabrallachehu, yisabrallu. Another key feature of Semitic languages is the system of consonant roots, which act as a framework. So, related meanings are expressed by changing the vowels in between or building bits on the beginning or the end, or doubling bits. Basically just playing around with this three consonant shape and then kind of using that as a template to fill in other things to express different meanings. So for example, the three consonants n, g, r create a family of words, also in Amharic, that are connected to speaking. Nagara, tnagara, tnagagara, tnagari, anagagar. Next, in the kind of splodgy pattern on the map, there is a group of languages, or are they, uh, called Nilo-Saharan. And they're spoken like along the Nile and in the Sahara Desert. And there seems to be quite a lot of suspicion in the world that um, linguists who looked at the languages of Africa ended up with a group of languages that they didn't really find a category for so they just put them in this one it's the kind of the other bin now the next group of languages i must admit a kind of my favorite or at least my joint favorite um and that's the niger congo languages which pretty much are spoken across 
the whole of the continent south of the Sahara. The Niger-Congo language family is the biggest language family in the world in terms of number of languages. Um, apparently there are 1,540, it's 1,540 named languages in the group. Although of course, once you start counting languages, you run into the problem of like where the border lies when, when one language kind of, they tend to blend into each other a lot, don't they? But one record that is indisputable is that the Niger-Congo languages are the third largest language family in the world in terms of native speakers with 700 million people speaking the languages. The Niger-Congo family owes a lot of its success to a group of people called the Bantu who as soon as they discovered agriculture decided they were off and started slowly but surely to migrate across the continent. Fast forward to today and Bantu languages, a group of really quite closely related languages, is spoken from the east coast to the west coast all the way down to the southern tip of the continent. One of my favourite things about Bantu languages is the grammar. One of my favourite things about Bantu languages is the grammar and a key component is the noun class system. Languages like French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, etc show the relationships between words by dividing all nouns into two groups, traditionally called masculine and feminine, and then having other words, such as articles and adjectives, agree in terms of gender and number. So, for example, in Spanish, we get el coche, los coches, la casa, las casas, el coche nuevo, la casa antigua, los coches nuevos, las casas antiguas, etc. Languages like German and Russian take it one stage further by adding a third group, neuter, to the mix. So we get der Stuhl, die Schule, das Auto. Bantu languages have taken the whole noun class thing to a whole new level entirely. Some of them have up to 19 classes of nouns, which not only adjectives but also verbs have to agree with. For example, in Swahili the word for student, mwanafunzi, is in the M wa class, which tends to contain words for people and living things. The word for new is pia, but if I want to say new student, I have to make it agree with the M wa class, so mwanafunzi mpia. If I want to say the new student has arrived using the word kufika, I have to put the verb into the perfect form, mefika, and then make it agree with the subject by adding a at the beginning. In the plural, all these agreements change. So the students have arrived is For other noun classes, the sentences the new whatever has have arrived sound like this. Miti mipia imefika. Kari chipia imefika. Magari mapia yamefika. Kalamu mpia imefika. Kalamu mpia zimefika. Ufunguo upia umefika. Funguo mpia zimefika. One of the things I like about grammar isn't kind of just like the studying of the rules and everything, which can be a bit dull, but what you can do with it. And one of the exciting things that you can do with the noun classes in Bantu languages is to convey new meanings. So, for example, umtu in Swahili means person, but jitu means giant. Maybe that's not that exciting. It is, it is, it is. Mtoto means child, but if you change it to the kivi class and say kitoto, that means baby, because it's small and cute. You can also use noun classes to distinguish between words that have the same form but different meanings. So, for example, again from Swahili, the word for aeroplane and bird is ndege. But if you use the animate agreements, so for example, ndege aliruka, that means the bird flew away. But if you do it as an inanimate, Ndege iliruka, that means the plane flew away. There's a pattern across all of the Bantu languages 
where using different noun classes you can express the country people are from, the person, a plural of the person, and their language. For example, a person from Botswana is called a Motswana, several of them are called Batswana, and they speak Setswana. Same thing happens with KwaZulu, Umzulu, Amazulu, Izizulu, Buganda, Muganda, Baganda, Luganda, Uswahili, Mswahili, Waswahili, Kiswahili, Kwakosa, Umkosa, Anakosa, Iziknosa. Which brings me to another thing that's absolutely fascinating about African languages, and that's their absolutely amazing repertoire of speech sounds. Now, the big prize winner, the, um, the Oscar winner, for speech sounds in the world. I think one of the largest consonant inventories of any language in the world goes to a language which rejoices under the name of Kho. Kho is also known as, rather disappointingly really, Ta. Ta. And it sounds like this. <laughs> Isn't that magnificent? The Kho language is a Khoisan language, and the Khoisan people have just like taken the human vocal tract and really put it through its paces. It's like, you know, we get a piano for Christmas, those of us who aren't Khoisan speakers, and we kind of, you know, go. They play Rachmaninoff with their left hands while like banging the table legs with a drumstick and climbing inside, pinging the strings and using a violin bow to play them. It's not just click consonants. Um, they've got this whole repertoire of, you know, as I said, basically what you can do with your vocal track, they do it. And while we're on this subject, I really don't like the label click language because although many of these languages in especially in southern Africa the Khoisan languages in the Kalahari and in Namibia um, have like this amazing array of, of click consonants like you know going from back to um, and everything in between <laughs> you can imagine that so you know there's the and the and the and the but they're not, the languages themselves aren't just about clicks. So, you know, you, you hear the term click language and it's as if they're gonna be going It's like call it, but they don't, you know, they have vowels and they have other consonants. So calling, calling something like, uh, and I do love saying that, uh, so calling something like, a click language is like saying, oh, do you, English is a lisp language because it's got th and th in it. You know, going up to people and saying, oh, can you say, can you lisp for me? <laughs> Which I suppose some people might do. Um, Quand tu dis le truc là du zézéma en anglais, les 30 000 plumes sur la gorge d'une grive? Ah oui, monsieur. Uh, there are 40,000 feathers on a thrush's throat. Oh, j'adore ça, les feathers. And the Khoisan language family, by the way, isn't actually proven to be, you know, to, for there to be a, a historic relationship between all these languages. They have lots of features in common. They happen to uh, live in the same place. But there's a, there's a phenomenon called a Sprachbund, which you can probably guess isn't an African term. It's from German, which is like a community, a, 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 um, a federation, if you like. <laughs> Of, of languages. So it's, I like to see it as like a neighborhood where you start borrowing sugar from each other. So what happens is that like in Southern Africa, there are these click consonants that, that only happen there or their use in language is unique to Southern Africa. And then people start borrowing them from each other. So I, don't, I think it's not necessarily known if all of the Khoisan languages have always, always had them. But definitely what happened is the Bantu people migrated down and 
kind of pushed the the Khoisan people out. They also intermarried with them, and so and borrowed some of their sounds. So that's why um, in languages like Hausa and Zulu, you also get click sounds. Not as many and not as frequently as you get in the Khoisan language in the Khoisan languages, but there's that kind of interchange. And also grammatically, um, some of the features that we looked at of Bantu, for example, the noun classes, some Khoisan languages also have those. So I don't know if they've been borrowed across. Excuse me, you, know, you borrowed my consonants um, here have a grammatical system. There's another unique sound that I came across quite recently, which is in the Shona language of Zimbabwe, and it involves whistling, which I can't do, but no, I mean, I, can't, I can do the sound, I can't whistle. Um, so I'd always wondered why Morgan Changarai's name had a V in it. Like, psh, ah, why a V? And then I discovered that it's actually whistled. So it's Changarai. There's also the, the, the word for ant in Shona is Mashoshi. Other common phonetic features of African languages uh, are not necessarily unique to the continent, but um, again, they're, they're kind of found a lot there. One of those is syllabic nasal, so you get words like, uh, for example, in Swahili, mtu, mtoto, ndudu, nkosi. Don't know what that means. I've said elsewhere that one of my favourite sounds is the lateral fricative, ahla, that uh, you find, for example, in one of the ways of saying goodbye in Osa, which is uh, salakakutle. Now that sound isn't unique to Africa. You can also find it, for example, in Welsh, Llangollen. Um, not just in Llangollen, but like in the Welsh language. And as an example, the place name Llangollen. Navajo, Mongolian, languages like that. Another not unique, but um, quite frequently found in Africa and less so elsewhere, set of sounds are the ejectives. So, uh, b and t. Uh, so, uh, for example, the Hausa word for cat is ikati. Now, those aren't unique to, um, to Africa. Also, you get them in, in Navajo and, and lots of uh, American languages and lots of North American languages. And in the exotic climes of Lancashire, uh, especially at the ends of, of words that end in P, T and K. So like took, book, put, Shot. I read recently a rather bizarre theory by someone called Caleb Everett that uh, one of the reasons that you get these kind of clumps of languages uh, using unusual sounds is to do with the geography. So according to him, it is easier apparently to say ejective sounds in high altitude because of the lower air pressure. Here I am at sea level, and I am perfectly capable of saying ooh la la. And also it might come as news to Caleb Everett that Burnley is not on the Tibetan plateau. Now, if you were looking at the map earlier and thought, I wonder what those Austronesian languages are, that doesn't sound very African, you would be right. The inhabitants of Madagascar originally migrated across the ocean from Borneo about a thousand years ago. So the language they speak is very, very close, very close indeed to languages spoken in Borneo. And they actually belong to the Malayo-Polynesian group of Austronesian languages. So, you know, related to stuff like Javanese, Malay, various languages of the Philippines, uh, Micronesia and Polynesia. So very, very different from your average African language, but because of the whole Sprachbund phenomenon, they also have syllabic nasals and some other features of, especially phonology, that they've borrowed from their neighbors across the Straits and possibly from the original inhabitants of the island of Madagascar. Most of the languages of Africa are written using the Latin script or the Arabic script, but there are some indigenous writing systems. For example, the magnificent Tifinagh script, which is used to write Berber languages, Tuareg, Tamazight, etc. 
The Tiffy Knife script is so magnificently modern looking, isn't it? It looks like uh, a really cool designer has, has come up with it recently, but it's ancient. And another cool writing system is the Guiz script, which is used to write Amharic, Tigray, Tigrinya, and other languages in Ethiopia and, and nearby. The Guiz script is what is known as an abugida. That's a writing system where there's a symbol for each syllable made up of a consonant shape modified by a vowel element. For example, all syllables beginning with a t sound have this basic shape, which on its own is read as t. For other vowels, we get tu, ti, ta, te, tri, and to. Amharic has ejective consonants too, and they have their own shape unrelated to the pulmonic version. So we get t, tu, ti, ta, te, ti, to. Affricates are represented by adding a horizontal line to the corresponding stop. So t becomes ch, and we get chu, chi, cha, che, chi, and cho. T adds little boots instead, giving ch, chu, chi, cha, che, chi, and cho. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this little romp around the linguistic treasures of Africa. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you'd like to experience more humorous takes on the world of linguistics, phonetics, phonology, polyglottery and diversity. See you soon.